All righty. Hey, everybody. How is everyone doing on this beautiful Friday? Back for another live stream. Very excited to be with you guys again. Trying to get my chat window going here. Cool. All right. So today's video, the final of the five part series, all about your basic gardening skills. Today's was all about irrigation and it was a you know a fairly deep dive all about uh, two different ways to set up your irrigation so using emitter lines or using drip tape in your garden beds and I don't see too many people using drip tape in their garden beds but I, I for me I think it's one of the best solutions out there and um, especially using the drip manifold system uh, that I use and uh, you know, you can just take it off from one valve connection, unscrew it, pull it off, very easy. Um, you can have complete control over individual lines. And uh, yeah, you just get total control. So I, that's why I really like it. So I hope uh, you guys learned a lot from it. Irrigation is a tricky thing, you know, it can be kind of confusing. So I hope I explained it in a way that, that made sense to anybody who's new to doing it. Hey Dylan, how's it going, man? But uh, how's everybody doing out there? How's everybody feeling? What are you guys planting? Are you guys planting any seeds? You have, you, have you put any transplants into the ground yet? Today I just went, I just went on a little kind of hike. Uh, my family and I are up in uh, Big Bear Lake, which is like two and a half hours from San Diego. Um, so we went out and enjoyed some nature, some fresh air and trees and all that good stuff. And, um, you know, took some photos with my camera, just kind of relaxing a little bit. Ain't never enough time. Uh, I like your name. That's really cool. Cameron's back. Oh, yeah. Gotta love Friday. We made it. Starting some seeds inside. Nice, Dylan. Awesome. What's, what uh, kind of seeds are you starting? Yeah, I know. I, I know the feeling of like running behind them planting. I, I feel you guys. But ne there's a. Uh, you can never be late though, as long as you get something in the ground eventually. We, we've still got plenty of time. It's only early April, so. Nice. Rainbow chard. Perfect. How's it going, Dave? How's, hey, Carol. Getting started tomorrow, sweet. Everyone's getting good stuff going. It's exciting. Love it. A lot of different pepper, cucumbers, tomatoes. Fun. Yeah, I love every single year, right? Like, I know I'm sure you guys do the same. You, you'll try out some new varieties you've never tried before, and or maybe there's some, some you read in the seed books, like some super delicious one, and you just want to go for it. I, I love doing that. I can't wait to... Uh, have my own gardening space again and be able to go crazy and experiment and all that fun stuff. So you just planted your brassicas. Nice. Perfect. <laughs> this cannabis cow. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a very useful plant. <laughs> Um, for squash bugs, that's not one I've had to deal with um, that much. And for any pesticide stuff, you guys, I'm going to refer you to Jadam, which is a type of Korean natural farming where you make your own pesticides. Um, I am not someone who likes to recommend pesticides or use pesticides or um, at the urban farm I did for three and a half years or the farm that I worked at with Jared Smith of Jared's Real Food for a year and a half. We, we never use pesticides or herbicides or chemicals ever. So that's not something that I'm super knowledgeable about or, um, you know, I know the basics, but I want I really want to get into using Jadam and that's what I'll be doing in the future and, and trying to teach people about that because I feel like that's a great alternative because you're not buying it. It's very inexpensive to make it and it's made from plants or um, like sulfur, things like that. So but for you know if you have really bad bugs like you know definitely look into like insect netting i think insect netting is a great way to not use any type of uh chemical or bt or spinosad which is like a bacterial uh biocide
Oh, nice, Matt. You found some Moringa? That's awesome. Yeah, when I was in Thailand, I found some Moringa. A farmer or somebody who had obviously planted it, but it was like just growing off the side of the road. I was like, whoa, I know what that plant is, and I, I tasted it, and it definitely was Moringa. I, I, I can't wait to plant more of that thing. If you guys don't know what Moringa is, it's like a super food. It just has like an insane amount of vitamins and minerals in it and antioxidants, and it's becoming you know a popular health food for uh, you know like in a powderized form. You can throw it in your smoothies or, or drink it. So, hey, Mira, how's it going? Oh, yeah, all about the Jadam. But, yeah, any of the pest questions, like pests, insects, you know, all that stuff, the number one thing that you can do is just have a diversity of plants, um, different types of plants, flowers, herbs, um, have sections, sections of your garden or your yard that aren't for productive crops, that are, you know, shrubs, trees, like as much diversity as you can pack in there. And beyond that, you know, having the healthiest soil possible is also going to be what's going to help deal with pests and disease. It's not going to eliminate it, um, but when your plants have the ability to defend themselves naturally, just like our bodies, when we have a strong immune system, um, well, we can resist disease and things like that as well, or we can knock it out of our bodies much quick, more quickly. So... You know, apply that same idea to plants as well. Um, Dirt Life is asking, how do you find yourself watering beds in the summer heat? So in San Diego, I'll just describe the climate. You know, it's dry, hot. Um, the summer, it's in the 90s up to 100. Um, I would typically water maybe every, depending on the crop, like so greens, like salad mixes or heads of lettuce. Uh, maybe I'd use my drip tape, uh, you know, every couple days every two, three days, I would always check, you know, that's one of my daily tasks. I'd go out there with my finger and just check, check the ground. Um, when it's a very hot day, I would always use my overhead on my greens, uh, cause you can do it, create an evaporative cooling effect. You just spray the leaves like every, every couple hours, go throw a minute of water onto them and they'll just keep them cooler, keep them from bolting. Uh, but with like tomatoes and stuff like that, um, you know, Every few few days, I would water them because I'm water the, watering them very deeply, so they've got plenty of water. Uh, not you know, once the plants are large, their roots are everywhere, so they've got access to water. Um, but you know, you got to check the soil. You know, check out how your plants are looking too. So there's no such thing as like a prescription for anything when you're dealing with nature, in my opinion. So that's why I, when I make my videos, or I try to describe things. I try to give you like the information surrounding the problem so you can like apply it to your context and, and what you have going on because um, there's just no such thing as a formula you can get close to a formula but it's just going to be different for everybody um, Dave Green's asking my tomatoes are right next to the edge of a garden beds wall Will the drip tape emitter water right up to the edge, or should I plan on planting things a little further from the edge? I don't know exactly what you're describing, but yeah, as long as the water, um, uh, once plants are bigger, like the roots will tap into that water. Maybe in the beginning when they're baby stage, like the first week of transplant, you might need to water them by hand a little bit, but it, what you're describing, it sounds like they'll be totally fine. And it's always great to stack shorter plants next to tomatoes. Um, the tomatoes can help shade them a little bit, give them more protection, and you're going to get a lot more crops. Um, I've got a couple interplanting videos where I show how I interplanted with tomatoes, with um, arugula and radishes and um, different crops. You can like stack stuff next to tomatoes or cucumbers. It's really awesome. Um, Cameron, do you? Get, um, he's asking where do I get my comfrey seeds online. I believe I got mine from Grow Organic. And there's a few different types of comfrey, and if you want ones that have viable seed, then you need to get true comfrey. But then there's some uh, other ones that don't produce seed, which may, you may want that because you don't want it to drop on the ground and then have more of the comfrey plants coming up. You may just want to be able to propagate it by root. Um, is it called balking? It's some number, balking 45 or, or something like that, I think is the other one that people use. Uh, but groworganic.com is where I got mine, I'm pretty sure. But once you have a comfrey plant, it's amazing because 
that's the easiest plant in the world to propagate with their crowns or their roots. And actually, I filmed a video about how to do it. I just haven't edited it yet. Um, uh, B dog, I was asking about diluting liquid nicotine on plants that I, you know, people use that for uh, the potassium, I think, right? And I know nicotine can also have pesticide properties too. But, um, gosh, man, I forgot. You'd have to look it up in the Jadam book. They talk about it in there. Or uh, Microbes by Marco is a, f a friend of mine on Instagram. He's super knowledgeable about that. He's growing his own tobacco right now. Um, so he can make his own, um, uh, he's making his own, uh, what do you call it? Um, water soluble potassium, WSK. He would definitely be someone to be more knowledgeable about it. I've never used nicotine as a uh, input yet. Will wood chips encourage ants? I don't believe so. I don't, I've never seen that. Uh, more wood chips will encourage other uh, insects that like carbon though, like little pill bugs. I've noticed when like soil is, has like larger carbon chunks, they, they're they really into that and they will go onto your plants and eat them a little bit. They're not horrible, but they, you know, they can do some damage. Um, Armenda's asking, I'm about to cut some holes in the grass and uh, in order to put uh, so a few edibles and perennials out there. Can they coexist? Yeah, they can, depending on what type of grass it is. I mean, most grasses, I would say, yeah, yeah, they can definitely coexist. You may even want to dig around, like where you're going to make this hole, dig it out, and then it's up to you. You could put landscape fabric in the hole to stop kind of the spread of that grass. Or you could just use like cardboard and wood chips. Eventually, though, the, the grass will probably sneak, creep back in. Uh, but it should not be an issue. They shouldn't bother the flowers or perennials. It should be okay. They should be okay there. Um, unless it's some gnarly, gnarly type of grass that I, I don't know about. Um, pork chops asking about pumpkins. Should they wilt before you water? Well, it's kind of tricky. Like I, I always recommend just going by the plant nearby and checking the soil and seeing if it's wet. Um, a lot of times, especially with pumpkins and squash and all that, if it gets hot, real hot during the day, like 90s, they will droop just naturally. Um, and then at the end of the evening, when it cools down, they'll perk back up like they're like nothing ever happened to them. And I think that's just, just part of their process. Um, they're just a little bit under stress and that's what they do. So check their water. If they have enough water, they're good. And if they didn't have enough water, like if they perk back up, then you know that they did have enough water. But if they don't recover in the evening, then um, you sh should definitely give them water. Mira, Mira is asking, this is a great question. When I can't find the right organic plant, it is, is it okay to get a regular plant and then raise them in an organic way? Yeah, I, I think so. I don't think there's a real problem with that. You know, I think... Um, the, you know, the plant will rebuild itself and, you know, remineralize, get all the nutrients that it needs once you go put it into good soil. I think one argument maybe for getting organic seeds or getting organic grown plants is just that it's helping to encourage the market to use more organic pra practices. And, um, you know, you're getting less uh, uh, synthetic fertilizers and pesticides that are running off and going into the groundwater or into oceans and things like that. To me, that's kind of the best um, reason to buy organic seeds or to buy organic uh, grown plants. But um, I don't see like a huge difference when I've done it either way. Once you put them into your really amazing soil, it, from what I've observed, it, it, it doesn't have that big of effect going to move because of the light. <clears throat> yeah, if you guys are enjoying the video, please hit the like button. It just, um, YouTube will show it to more people so they can have a chance to get in here and ask a question.
Yeah, comfrey tea is awesome. Comfrey is just a really sweet plant. Oh, you know, one thing I saw, I learned from, oh gosh, I'm blinking on her name. Uh, she was on the No-Till Market Garden podcast. Uh, gosh dang it. Totally played. Salamander Farms, I think is the name of her farm, but it's in Kentucky. And I had the opportunity and honor to go to her farm. Um, maybe her name will come to me, but she showed us um, around some of her trees. She was using comfrey as like a block to like block out grasses so they couldn't get into the area where she wanted to grow her trees and other plants just because the root zone of the comfrey is just so thick the, the grasses couldn't penetrate it. So she had them like stacked like a big, you know, wall all around the plants um, in the ground and it uh, kept grass from creeping in. So that was a really cool uh, thing I learned recently. Yeah, comfrey is a great mulch. It's great. You can feed it to animals. You can make uh, liquid fertilizer out of it. You can make salves out of it for human health. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's one of those plants that you gotta. I think it's a really really good to have in your in your garden. And um, be careful where you put it though, because wherever you put it, it's gonna be there forever. Because any, it doesn't matter. Like you could try to dig dig it out. Like you could take your time and probably get all the roots out. But if you leave any roots behind, it's coming back. James D. All right. Yes. You wanted to know about the diatomaceous earth. So that was that white powder that we had put around the plants and we were going to leave our house for a few days. So, and we were getting chomped on by some different worms, maybe some cut worms. Cause I couldn't find any of the worms on the, on the plant itself. And so we just put diatomaceous earth around, which is basically just silica. Um, and if you looked at it, like on a microscopic level, it'd be like a bunch of little razor blades. So when like ants walk across it or cockroaches or a worm or things like that, um, it'll cut them and uh, they just won't want to walk across it or it'll kill them even. Um, so diatomaceous earth is a good one. It's, it's a temporary fix if it gets wet or, you know, the wind blows it or things like that, then it won't stop the ants, but it is, um, it's a, you know, it's an, at least an organic way to try to stop uh, the bad guys from getting on. I, I just want, like, in the beginning of the plant, I didn't want them, the solar panels to get eaten down so badly that they couldn't produce the new leaves. Once the plant, you know, gets bigger in another week, it won't really matter what happens with the worms. It'll just outpace how much they can eat anyways. So that was sort of the thinking behind the diatomaceous, since I couldn't be there to try to be on top of the plants. Lucas, this is a good question. Would it be better to mix azomite into finished compost right before putting it onto beds as opposed to adding it to a new compost pile? I've done it both ways, um, but eventually it was just too much work to try to mix it up with each wheelbarrow load. So what I do now is, and I think it works great, and I, I, I think it makes total sense. Um, and you see farms like Neversink Farm, Connor Crickmore doing this. So you just... Um, after you've prepared your bed, or whatever, you know, took out the previous crop, done whatever else you wanted to do to that bed, broad fork or whatever. Um, uh, well, you can do this before broad forking too. Just dump out your uh, fertilizer or your azomite or whatever amendments that you're going to do. Just sprinkle out over the top of the bed, add the compost on top, uh, and then just plant right into that. Or tilth, whatever you, if you want to tilth, you can do that to mix it all together. Um, but that's how I do it. I, I think it's just uh, the, the labor intensity is not worth it. Um, I think it's obviously if you're going to do like a soil mix or like a, a seedling mix, then yeah, mix it together. But um, for out in your beds, I think that's the right way to do it. If you have a small garden, maybe you want to mix it and get it super blended up together. Then I think in that context, it makes sense. But any sort of scale, I don't think it makes sense. The uh, 06 Wade, what is the best and easiest way to graft a fruit tree? I have a video on that for grafting apple trees. And I think the wedge graft is probably the easiest. That's just where you're cutting your scion wood into a little wedge. You just cut the rootstock down the center, you put them together, and you wrap it with parafilm, and done. So that's real easy. Um, there's other ones. There's bud grafts and bark grafts. Like a bark graft isn't that hard either. Um, and there's even tools that you can get so you don't have to be that skilled with a knife. 
the hardest part about doing the wedge graft or any grafting is just having that finesse with the knife so that you're making that perfect wedge shape. There's no like wave because you want to have the cambium layers of the the rootstock and the scion wood match really well. The scion, or the sorry, the cambium layer that I just said, that's like the outer. Um, uh, there's like the xyum, the phloem, the cambium layer. There's all these layers, but the most outer layer is like where that healing is going to start occurring. And you need those to be touching for the healing process to happen. Um, I talk about that in the video, and I, I show picture or, uh, video and pictures of that uh, process. What's the best soil mix to use in grow bags for potatoes? Um, just straight up compost, honestly, would work fantastic. If you, can get, if you have access to really good locally made compost, I'd go for that. Salamander Springs. Thank you, Cameron. That's exactly it. I, 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 can't, remember, I can't remember her name, though, but <clears throat> it kills me. But, yeah, she, uh, she is a legend. She is, um, I don't know, I hope she writes a book or something. Like, she, she lived in, I forgot what country, but somewhere in South America for, like, 15 years and learned how to breed corn. Um, from the people there, and uh, so, you know, in South America, I believe is where the original corn maize came from, and then it came up through um, in North America and then throughout the world. Um, so she, when I got to visit, like she had this incredible corn everywhere, just because um, she's a seed saver, and she she you know breeds corn and stuff, and she sells it to Southern Southern Exposure Seeds, I believe is the company. Um, so if you want some incredible like heirloom corn, look at a uh, Southern Exposure. I think that's the name of the seed company. Anyways, she's an amazing like permaculturist, like homesteader. I've yeah, like there's I've met, it's only a few people in the world like her. Like she is really incredible. Pat Lucking. What about soil that is close to the sea? Could it be salty? Hoping that a raised bed will be okay. Yeah, it'll be fine. Actually, the the soil near coastal areas is like an amazing place to grow. Um, and a lot of farms are there because um, it, the mineral content is much higher there because it is kind of blowing in on the wind. So I don't think it'll be an issue at all. And in Korean natural farming, we actually use diluted seawater to remineralize. Re um, they don't buy in uh, azomite or things like that. Yeah, Cameron, I don't know if it works against Bermuda. I've never tried it, but at Salamander Springs, she, 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 uh, it looked pretty effective to me. Company is definitely a perennial. Um, Mark, can I get any good soil in bags? I just put seeds in the normal garden soil. Yeah, um, like in my video that I showed during like this whole week, I did a five part series about all about basic gardening stuff. And in the first video of the series, if you just go back in my videos recently, I, I talked about Kellogg garden soil. That's the best one that you can get from like Home Depot or Lowe's. Um, either the garden soil or the raised bed mix is good. That's my go. That's my go to. I, I would recommend if you're if you if you can't get locally made stuff. If you want to like go and spend a lot more money, there's like Fox Farms and um, some other bagged soil that's like real high quality. It's just a bit more expensive. Or if you're down in San Diego, um, what's the name of the company? God, I'm blanking right now. Uh, Aliki Aliki Soils out in San Diego. They're excellent. My buddy runs. Helps run their company. Mark's asking, I have a cherry tree I've never cut and I'm afraid of accidentally killing it. How can I cut it? Are you talking about pruning it? Well, I'm um, trying to take a pruning class from a local expert if you can. But if you're pruning it in the dormant um, time and you just trim off like 20% of the tree, like you're not, it's going to be fine. Um, but take some pruning classes. That's, um, you know, I did some pruning on my own, just learning from YouTube. But I, you know, I went to a few different 
classes from some local experts who have been doing it for decades. And that really, that was more helpful than anything I learned on YouTube because, you know, we got to prune trees together and, you know, it's a real art. You know, you get to spend your whole life just learning about trees and how to take care of trees. And, you know, you want to stand back and look at the tree and um, really give it the best shape possible that, that's going to help it produce the, the best fruit possible. Um, Bill's asking, I love the videos. What's, what is legally uh, required to do an urban farm? Well, right now, basically nothing, thank goodness. Um, and definitely, uh, if they told us we couldn't, we couldn't uh, legally do it, like we should break the law, honestly. It's ridiculous. No one can tell human beings that they can't grow food. So. But in general, um, there's, there is no restriction. If you make under $500,000, um, there's no real requirements on us yet. But we'll see what happens in the future. Um, for like selling at a farmer's market though, you typically need some sort of certificate. Like in San Diego, the county requires that you have a county inspector come out. And it's kind of a big joke, honestly. Like it really doesn't provide any consumer protection at all. Basically, they just come out, they look at what you're growing, and then they check off what you're, what they see in the ground or, or, you know, I was able to show them seeds like, hey, I'm going to plant these tomatoes later in the year, like sign me off for the whole year, right? Or now they actually sign you off for a three-year period. So, and the idea is that they're, 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 they're coming out to check so that it's some sort of proof that what you're selling at the farmer's market, uh, you actually grew it. But, you know, if you, what I just described to you, like, how does that actually stop me from going to Mexico and buying a bunch of cheap produce and then selling it? Like, it really wouldn't stop it. As long as I'm selling what's on that list that's approved, you know. So it's kind of a, it's just another little loophole you have to jump through. But um, that's where, you know, being a small farm, like, we have all the evidence in the world because all of us have pictures, we have Instagrams, we have Facebooks, you, you know. We can take little videos of what we're doing. The customer has way more trust in us because they can just see it or they, they're talking to the farmer. So um, versus like in a grocery store, you don't know who the farmer is or who grew it. Who grew it. So, um, But beyond that, like selling the restaurants, selling to private customers, there's nothing required. And there should never be. And there's a lot of uh, food freedom movement stuff going on. I know Joel Salatin has his uh, Rogue Foods conference going on now. And lots of farmers are looking into very interesting ways of selling produce and getting around all laws and regulations, uh, which is just fantastic. And more states are starting to try to pass food freedom uh, acts so that you could make food in your home and then sell it. You don't need to have a, a, a certified kitchen or any of this other nonsense that crushes small business competition and just keep the big guys uh, in business. Oh, Porkchop, how long does it take to become a great gardener? Well, I just say it depends on how much like time and effort you put into it. I would say though, you know, two to three years of really going hard at it, um, you can become a great gardener, I think. And really, you know, you can read books, you can watch videos on all that's very helpful, but ultimately the experience that you gain through doing it yourself is going to be the most valuable. Or if you have an opportunity to work on or volunteer at a farm, that is going to be like invaluable experience. The experience um, is everything to me, I think. And I know a lot of all farmers like feel the same way about that. If, uh, Keith, if you want to grow apples from seed, um, you will not get the same apple. Um, I know you will not get the same apple. Yeah, you don't get the same apple. The genetic variety is not, you don't know what you're gonna get, um, but this is how they start new trees and, and develop new varieties. So um, you're welcome to do that, but um, if you're gonna, if you wanna experiment and do that, that's great. Just know that the fruit may not be good. And um, if you have a limited amount of space, then you'd be wasting that space. And it's gonna take you like, three, four, five years to find out that it's not the tree that you want. Um, but if you want guaranteed fruit and a guaranteed variety, then you should graft or just buy a bare root grafted tree and plant that in the ground. But planting from seeds is really interesting. If you have the land to experiment and mess around, you, you, know, you, could, you could plant 20 seeds and plant 
20 of those trees from seed and you could like come across some really cool variety. So um, I'm definitely into that idea. It's just most people, you know, won't have that type of space to, to try to do that or they don't want to take the time and you go to all that effort and then you get a tree that's not that good, then it would kind of stink. Um, pork chop, I was thinking I could go get forest floor, earth, rotten leaves, pine needles, moss, and mix it into my soil. I would not mix it into my soil because it's not fully broken down. And if it's, you know, high carbon material, it, it can kind of suck out ni uh, nitrogen and stuff. That's a great, that's great to use as a mulch on top of your soil and then let that break down naturally. Just, you know, cause think about in a forest, um, unless there's animals like mixing it into the soil, that's not gonna happen. It's just gonna sit on, on top of that, the top of the soil and then break down over time um, and then eventually become part of the soil. So try to mimic that or take all that forest floor material, um, put it in a pile somewhere else. You'll get a bunch of really good leaf mold and all that good stuff. Then take that and put it out into your soil. That's what, that's what I would do. Um, Row cover weights, where'd I go? <laughs> yeah, they find a diaper in the compost, oh, nasty. Yeah, if you get like city compost, man, you can find some gnarly stuff in there. So finding a good compost maker is like really, really important. Um, someone asked about row cover. Uh, you just need to look up, I, I, it depends where you live because there's different weights and the higher weight that you go, the more light that it'll cut. Um, you know, so it's anywhere from like two to five or six degrees of, of frost protection, I believe, depending on the weight. And that's just going to depend on your area. For me, I use the lightest row cover, which I think is Agravon 15, which just gives you two or three degrees of protection. And I forgot, I forgot, it cuts the light by 10, 20%, something like that. Um, that worked great for me. Um, other than that row cover, then I did 50% shade cloth for my greens in the summer. And that's for San Diego, that's all that I needed. But row cover is an awesome way to get season extension. And, and um, it even can double as uh, animal protection too from certain animals. And unfortunately, they closed all the businesses. It's a giant disaster, all for a, a virus that is uh, not even dangerous when you compare it to all the other numbers of other viruses like H1N1 or influenza. But I'm sure I'll get a lot of hate if I talk about that from the uh, brainwashed people. That's okay. We can ban them. Um... Let's see, o O6 Wade, is a greenhouse the best option to grow food year round, especially to protect against fr frost? Well, um, I, I think caterpillar tunnels are really fantastic too. Dip, you know, if you're like up in Canada, then yeah, you will. You, you, that would be the only way to do it, a heated greenhouse. But um, depending on where you are in the world, um, you can do a lot of good stuff with, like I just know in 7A, 7A and up for sure, you can just do caterpillar tunnels and go four seasons. Um, uh, uh, Mark's got a lot of uh, buildings and shadows and stuff. Yeah, that makes it does make it trickier, but you just have to like um, just grow certain crops. You know, you just there's just certain things that you won't be able to do and um, you got to specialize a bit more. How long does it take for leaves to rot? Well, it depends if you live in a dry dry climate or a humid climate, if it's cold or if it's hot, that's gonna like change that. But I don't know, anywhere from three to six months, something like that, I'd, depend, you know, depending on the circumstances. But leaf mold is one of the best, uh, uh, you know, microbial inoculants. Um, it's a great compost. Uh, in Jadam, that is the main microbial source uh, for making Jadam microorganism solution. And um, 
it's it's really really good stuff if you have a lot of leaves i would collect them and i'd make my own leaf mold and you can even you know make an extract from the leaf mold and then water that into your gardens or just make jms if you uh, get the jadam book and learn more about that <laughs> no, I've never, I don't really talk to my plants. Yeah, I've seen different studies about, you know, um, playing music for them or, I don't know, I think there's definitely something to like, uh, you know, like animals when they know when you, like the owner is around, like they know who you are. And if you bring like some new person in, they'll get kind of scared of them, uh, things like that. So, and I think that plants have kind of have that same response. I've heard of different things where like the, the head grower will leave and go on vacation and like the other people that stay behind to take care of the plants will kind of notice like they're just not looking as good for some reason. So yeah, I think there's something to that. They know that there's some, uh, um, there's a connection between man and, and nature, um, obviously. And nature knows that we are uh, set apart from, from nature. So uh, I think there's definitely something to that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really talk to my plants though. Yeah, Stephanie, I just, I watched the new video, Curtis Stone video today and saw his whole, um, his plan for his new farm. It looks awesome. And uh, I'm excited to watch on fromthefield.tv, like how he's going to do it all. And I'm excited to watch him grow new crops and things that um, are just really uh, more food source uh, centric. Because I know once I start my homestead, I want to grow a lot more food um, for my family. So I don't have to go to the grocery store as much because... You know, with my urban farm, I, I didn't, I like went to grocery store like maybe once a month or, or something. Um, but that was great because, you know, I could grow all my greens, my roots, uh, some of the summer veg, like green beans and tomatoes and cucumbers. But, you know, obviously I can't do it all on a small farm. But being at the farmer's market, I could just go trade with people or go buy from my other vendors there. So that's what I always did. Like at the end of the market, I just go buy the rest of my produce I needed for the week. And that was, I was awesome. That's one of my favorite things about selling at the market was I never had to go to the grocery store because between them and then one of my, Jared Smith, my farmer buddy, um, getting some of his food, I never, I just always just ate local food or, or food that I grew. But I'm excited to start growing some other cool stuff like Curtis is going to do um, to grow more of those, you know, high calorie good stuff. Stuff that's not as good for profit. Whoa, pork chops in zone three. Whoa, you are way up there. Um, yeah, if you can bring them indoors, like to a garage or somewhere where it's going to be a bit warmer, you should do that for sure. Oh, are you talking about, oh, your compost, I'm sorry. Um, you don't have to cover your compost. I mean, I might cover it though, just to make sure like, you know, the moisture just stays consistent and stuff. Like that. I don't know. Like I don't, I'm from San Diego, man. It's like, I've never lived through a winter, uh, an actual winter. So yeah, I'm not the best person to ask about winter growing. Yeah. It's so crazy. The seed companies, they're, they're all like, like sold out and I mean, it just goes to show you how many people are interested in growing their own food now, which is, uh, it's a blessing and a curse a little bit, just because it's kind of crazy, like, oh, the seed companies are selling out, that's, that's gnarly, but um, I'm excited to see so many people getting into growing their own food, it's just, um, it's one of the positive things coming out of this situation. When should you fertilize your tomato seedlings? The seedlings? Well, you can, you can, um, kind of like I did in, in, uh, which video was it? The, f I think it was the second video, the second video of grow food. Now I showed like how to make just like a nutrient water where you could, um, you could add kelp or, uh, azomite, fish emulsion, something like that. You know, you can make like a worm extract, uh, and then just water that in. I think that's a good thing to do one time when you, once you've potted up your tomatoes into the bigger pot. And, um, you know, but start with really good soil and, and they shouldn't really have a problem or, or add a little bit of organic fertilizer into that soil mix when you uh, pot up and that'll help you. I don't know when I'm moving to Tennessee. 
um, as soon as we can find the right property and house. And it's uh, going to be a bit of a, uh, you know, it's a little bit more difficult now with everything going on, but <clears throat> we'll be able to find the right place. And I'll let you guys know as soon as I uh, do find the right property and everything. And <clears throat> I'll obviously be making videos about that once I once I do that and share kind of my thoughts about like how to find the right property or what I'm doing at least. No sellout. Um, how wide should I cut my wood if I don't want to the roots of the plants? I'm not sure what you're asking about cutting the roots. I don't even know what you mean, but what's the best berry to put down before building a bed? A lot of, you know, a ton of farmers use landscape fabric. You know, that stuff, depending on the quality you get, it'll last 10 to 20 years. You can cut holes in the fabric and plant directly into that and have no weeds. So there's, uh, there's a lot of great reasons to use landscape fabric. My business right now, well, I shut down my farm about a month and a half ago before I traveled to Asia for a month to go visit my wife's family and stuff. And then the plan was to come back and then move to Tennessee and then start, uh, you know, going and visiting houses and stuff to, to find my property. But because of the whole virus situation, we decided to stay in San Diego and shop from San Diego. So, but my business was fantastic up until the day I, I stopped it. Um, so... And a lot of farmers' businesses are doing very well right now because of the demand for local food. Chuck and Kelly, do you think it'd be good to let some of your plants go to seed? Yeah, if you are just a home gardener or a homesteader, absolutely. Save your seed. I think that's uh, learning how to do that is a really valuable skill. And it's really fun. You can start adapting seeds to your local area. Um, but if you're a market gardener, then I, I wouldn't do that. I, it's not... And from a business standpoint, it doesn't make sense. Amar. Oh, that's cool, man. You saw the Epic Gardening video? That's really cool. I know. I can't believe that video. Like, it has a million views now. It's like, it's so insane. And like a little backstory on that video that me and Kevin from Epic Gardening did. That was the first time that we had ever met. He, we chatted online or whatever, because we're like, hey, whoa, like, we both grow in San Diego. That's awesome. And then he came over and we just filmed that whole thing with a cell phone. I don't think he even had a tripod. I think he was just holding the phone like this. And I, you know, was pretty new to doing videos at that point too. Um, or he had been doing videos for years, but, um, yeah, like first time we met, like totally off the cuff and that video, you know, did super well. So that was, it was really, it's been really fun to have people get stoked on that. Oh, Lucas, I'm so sorry, man. That sucks. Got snow. Yeah, I don't know, man. I mean, that's a hard thing to prevent. If you could, um, if you had like row cover, like some, um, you know, some greenhouse plastic and then you nine gauge wire or EMT conduit, maybe you could have put that out over the top to stop it. But man, that's a bummer. I'm sorry. Can fruit trees root from just cuttings? Yes, Lee, certain trees can. Um, like pomegranates, fig trees, uh, grapes, they're not a tree, but grapevines can do that. Um, passion fruit, kiwi, there's a, there's a lot of them out there. There's a lot, of, uh, there's a lot more trees too that I'm not saying. There's, yeah, there's um, if, if you just look, Google search it, what trees can I root from cutting? But those are the easiest. And you can do them with air layer, or you can root them in water. You can root them in just soil. There's a lot of ways to, to root from cutting. Cameron's asking, my farm uses pine shavings for chicken bedding. So I've got a lot of it in my compost, but it takes forever to break down. Mmm. Yeah, um, maybe when you build your compost pile, you put more greens in there. And if you can get more chicken manure, that will help it to break down faster. You could also uh, inoculate it better with like 
uh, either Jadom JMS or IMO. Um, you could try inoculating with Bokashi. Things like that would help to speed it up. But, you know, the pine shavings, like if it's a real issue, then maybe you should switch to a different carbon source that'll break down faster. Or have like different piles, you know, have a pine shavings pile that'll take longer and have another pile that'll break down faster so you can use it quicker. Lee, yeah, so from rooting a tree from a cutting, like a pomegranate, for instance, you just cut it at the no at a node, um, like where it branches off from like a main stem is where a node is, and then just literally just shove it into a pot of soil. That's it. And just keep the soil moist, and then it'll grow roots eventually. And you'll notice it'll start to wake up in the spring. And you do this in uh, winter when the trees or the vine is dormant. That's when you take all your cuttings, whether it's um, a cutting that you can do like that or you're, or you're grafting it, you're always taking your cuttings when they're dormant. Mm. No sellout. You don't want your plants to root into the soil below. I wonder why. Um, I would say as long as, I don't know, if you're doing carrots, you might want it to go a bit deeper, but six inches would be plenty. I'd probably do a six inch bed just so that, because when they get wet and over the course of a few months, the ground will settle more and it'll get compacted more. So I do six inches to start with and you can grow almost every, any vegetable crop. But depending on the, you know, tomato or something, that's, those roots will go deeper than, than the six inches. <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to go to Minnesota. It's too cold, man. I'm, I'm not, uh, I like winter, but that is too much winter for me. Apple trees cannot be root, rooted from cutting. They have to be grafted. Or you can grow them from seed. Nice, Matt. Thanks for posting that video or that um, link to the website there. <laughs> yeah, Stephanie, I'm excited to grow in the South. I'm really excited. It's like things grow too well there. There's like too much, <laughs> too much warmth and, and uh, moisture and things just go crazy. But I'm excited for the challenge of being able, of growing there. And I think it's going to really expand my ability to grow. And um, also the advice that I can give the people growing in a different, uh, totally different climate with way more pest pressure, way more animal pressure, um, and, and all the different like issues that the South faces. So I'm ex really excited to get over there and start and start. Wow. And zone three, you can't start until June 1st. That's gnarly. What do you have like a four month season or something? That's nuts. Yeah, I was in Asia, I was in Thailand, and then went to South Korea. And now I'm back. In Washington State, it rains a lot. Nice. Keep, keep up the good work growing all the, those veggies. Donna's getting some ducks and chickens. Awesome. It, I love having um, any type of fowl, really. I mean... I want to get, I'd love to have turkeys and chickens are amazing. I love chickens. They're my favorite farm animal. Um, the chickens do well with helping in the garden. Yeah, they can. Um, chickens are good. Maybe when you want to prep the ground, like, you know, they can help you take out stuff. They'll eat up, um, you know, some leftover stuff that's on the ground or, but once your garden's in, in, in a process and in growing stuff, you don't want to let them in your garden because they'll just like devour stuff. They love eating greens. Um, but maybe if you're taking out a bed or something, I've let them go in there and do their thing. Um, or prepping a new plot. They're good for that. Ducks are good for, they can eat larger stuff like ducks and geese. They can, uh, um, they can even eat like some fruit that falls on the ground. And uh, they're good to run behind certain things. Like if you did a cover crop, they're good to let run through that too. Add the manure in there. You just have to manage them and what they're doing. Very cool. 
you guys are gonna grow some good stuff this year. It sounds like it's awesome. Uh, Mark, yeah, don't worry about your grapes. You can cut like all the professionals; they cut them back to almost nothing. Um, so don't worry about that. They they will come back. I have a grape pruning video if you want to check that out, so you don't get too worried. How can I feed them back up again? Well, yeah, just you know, give them all the good stuff. You know, compost. If you want to use organic fertilizer, do that. But you know, some really quality compost is you know basically everything plants need. Um, you can supplement minerals in the form of kelp or uh, diluted seawater or azomite. That's always a good thing to add to. Or you know, fish emulsion, fish hydrolysate. That's a great organic fertilizer. Nice, Johnny. Yeah, the South's amazing. I love the South. I'm a big fan. People are just so um, much more friendly, I, I find. More down to earth. And more into freedom. They don't like to being told what to do, and they don't like li listen to orders as much as people on the coasts. Um, New Iberia. Well, Oh, in Louisiana, nice. Cool, Cameron, thanks for hanging out. Good talking with you. Have a great week. Yeah, compost is everything. Compost is the best. Um, if you can learn how to make it really successfully, it, it will really improve uh, the way you garden. And if you have a local person nearby that makes great compost, they are invaluable. And also, you know, worm castings is something I just have to recommend you get into if you aren't doing it already. Vermicomposting is it's so easy like it doesn't take any work at all and it's the best fertilizer in the world you know you don't need to buy fertilizer just just get vermicompost going and use that as your fertilizer and there's a lot of other ways that you can use vermicompost to stretch it out further um, uh, you can you can grow out that biology if you make aerated teas yeah nature's always right is hardcore pro liberty man absolutely nature's always right it has a lot of meetings right Natural law. Um, but uh, I try to focus on gardening and just I want to teach people how to grow food and wake people up uh, about the truth through nature. <clears throat> A lot of people lose their mind if you start talking about politics. They just can't handle it. So, But I like to talk about it here and there on live streams and stuff. But you'll hear me mention little little things about my opinion on things here and there. I know, yeah, the South, the only problem with the South is the bugs and ticks. I hate ticks. It's It sucks when you get them on you. It's disgusting. But, you know, there's no perfect place. There's no perfect area. So the virus is showing us the real thing in humans. Absolutely. I can't believe the fear people have and how they're just bowing down to everything the government's saying. You know, you got to stay in your home. You mean I, I don't have freedom of move, movement, freedom of association? freedom to uh, do whatever I want my own property it's out of control it's you know it's yeah it's anti it's uh, unlawful it's anti-constitutional but even more important our rights don't come from the constitution or any piece of paper or any government they ultimately come from God or if you don't believe in God then it's uh, it's an innate thing that is just a part of this universe it's natural law and no human being has the right to rule over you and uh to tell you what you can and can't do with your body or your land. And that's at the root of all farming as well, is uh, personal autonomy, self-sufficiency, all that good stuff. And, you know, that's why I love teaching about gardening and farming, because I want to make people more self-sufficient. I want people to realize that we don't need these giant systems to steal from us, to protect us, keep us safe, feed us, and all these different, these different things, as we're seeing right now. Um, the government has destroyed the economy um, by w overreacting. And now we got 10 million people out of work. I know a lot of people that lost their jobs or you know, their salary got cut, all sorts of things. You know, the government does incredible amounts of damage. They kill, they've killed 300 million people in the last century. So uh, I'm not too worried about personal or private people hurting anybody. 
um, it's governments, standing arm armies, militaries. That's what that's what uh, harms people. I'm not worried about a gang coming and stealing from me. I already have a gang in Washington D.C. that takes, you know, depending on how much money you make, 20 to 50 percent of your income. So we, we're already living in tyranny. We're already living with, uh, you know, a gang that controls us and, and try, you know, they're tr trying to force us to stay in our homes and all this kind of nonsense. So. Can I do a video on growing chayote in containers? Um, well, I'm not going to live in San Diego much longer, so I, I don't know if I can grow that in Tennessee. Um, for con Yeah, you could grow that just straight up in compost, and I bet it would do pretty good. I don't know a lot about those plants, though. Um, like, there's like, I think that's related to like cherry moya and antimoya and all those two. I think they're kind of a similar. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm thinking about something different. June bugs. Um, yeah, Tara. Tara um, alfalfa meal is a great um, fertilizer, definitely. Mixed with autumn leaves in the compost pile. That sounds really good. I don't think that they GMO alfalfa. I'm pretty sure that they don't, but maybe look into that. But alfalfa, you know, they feed it to animals and all that. It's good stuff. Um, can you compost dog food? Uh, yeah, you could do it. Uh, for me, um, any sort of questionable, weird, weird stuff, I would run it through a Bokashi composting process and let those anaerobic microbes just go to town on it and destroy it and then throw it into an aerobic pile. But dog food, it's like, it's sterile. Like it's already, you know, I, I think it's pretty safe. Um, you know, if I was farming, like I wouldn't use it because I sell to my customers and I don't want to use anything weird that would go, eventually go to my customers just in case. But so, oh, this, yeah, Keith, here's a great question. What's the difference between soil and dirt? And, um, even I make this mistake sometimes. Sometimes I'll be talking about the soil and I, and I use the word dirt just because we've kind of gotten the definitions mixed up. But soil is, um, is sand, silt, clay that has, microbi has biology in it. It has all the microbes, the arthropods, the different living organisms that exist in soil. Dirt is just sand, silt, or clay that is just void of those. So have you ever seen like some open uh, lot and it's just a bunch of dirt? There's like not even weeds growing there. That's dirt. Um, so it's just minerals and you know the the, comp the 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 different things that make up dirt just without the biology. When you add the biology and it's you know has organic matter and now it's soil. It's like a basic way to explain it. Murfreesboro, very cool. That's a great little town. We drove through there. Um, yeah, now the whole Nashville area and around there is just like blowing up right now, which, um, I don't know. I'm trying to stay away from the bigger cities, but, um, Murfreesboro is beautiful, beautiful little town. Yeah, Mark, I agree. That's my goal too, with doing YouTube and making, you know, trying to get more young, especially young people to see growing food as a possible career because we need a lot more local food. We need more local businesses all that sort of stuff. Um, and uh, I think it's just one of the best responses to everything going on in the world. And um, it's, you know, it's one of the uh, good things, positive things that has come out of this virus is that the, you know, a lot of people have realized how fragile the system is and that they maybe shouldn't be so reliant on it. And they should maybe grow a little bit of their own food learn a little bit more about their health and, and how this, you know, their bodies work, how food is grown. So that's one of the positives that I've really taken away from all this. Oh, nice pork chop. Yeah. Every time I grow a new vegetable or a new fruit or something, I'm always blown away by how good it is. And even my first garden I ever had, my first started growing food, um, and I didn't know anything about growing vegetables, nothing. You know, it was my first try and I ate what I grew, I just couldn't believe it. I was like, this tastes better than anything I've ever had in the store. How is this possible? I'm not a professional. I'm not a farmer. Like, how, how can I grow something better? And that was one of the first light bulbs that went off in my head 
of like, wait a second, like something's going wrong here. Like, how, how is this possible if somebody who does nothing about growing food and is able to grow something that's better than a professional? Um, and then you go down the rabbit hole and find out like, oh, okay, like it's basically just this, uh, like a factory, you know, it's all this factory farming stuff. So it's not about creating nutrient dense food or healthy food. It's just, you know, it's just about having this object that looks like a fruit or vegetable. Um, but it's not almost <laughs> doesn't even count as one when you look at the nutrients in it and all the chemicals it has on it. Compost your enemies. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, you can compost anything. You can compost bodies. You can compost. I've composted chickens. I've composted a raccoon before. Uh, you know, you can definitely do it. And it's full of tons of good, good stuff that'll be uh, feed your plants. <laughs> yeah, Mark, that's hilarious. I've definitely seen people that are scared of, of uh, eating stuff from the garden. Like, oh, it has dirt on it. Actually, you want to eat that dirt or that soil because that's going to inoculate your gut biology. Uh, so you want that. <laughs> Starting growing long beans at 10 years old in Singapore. That's really cool, Carol. That's really cool. Yeah, it's interesting when I go over, if I visit different countries, I, I've spent a lot of time in Asia in my adult life, and it's really cool to see cultures that are still somewhat connected to the land, um, especially like, uh, especially in like Southeast Asia, um, or even in South Korea too, like, it's mostly just like the older generation, like grandparent age. Um, but anywhere that there's like an open area, even in the city, like I saw people growing corn in just this little like one foot by 10 foot strip and peppers and all this sort of stuff. Whereas here in America, like we're like another generation, like in front of them as far as like industrialization and all that stuff. So it's like, we've lost so much of that knowledge, um, because of the, everything got industrialized and everyone just is a consumer now They just buy everything. Um, but it's really, it's really weird to see, uh, like you, you can kind of go back in time a little bit when you go to other countries and see like, oh, whoa, this is what we used to have in America too. And like, look how great this is. And, um, so I'm hoping that a lot of, you know, the younger generation can kind of, of in America will kind of bring that back a little bit. We need, we can't forget the knowledge of how to grow your own food and how to take care of people, how to grow natural medicine and, um, get away from using all these pharmaceutical meds and stuff for, for managing disease when we can heal disease through diet and through, um, non Western medicine means Western medicine is amazing. If you need, you know, you uh, get in a car accident or you need to go to the ICU or like, you know, to be kept alive, to have a surgery, like that's, you know, that's where med Western medicine is incredible. Um, but as far as treating illness and disease, like they don't know what they're doing. They just treat symptoms and keep people sick. Yeah, Stephanie, it's, it is crazy. Like we're all growing, like all the, all the food is grown in non-living soil. Now it's all destroyed by tillage and chemicals. So, you know, they're just fed basically. Like, here's what I, this is how I like to describe like the modern conventional food system. Like they've destroyed the stomach of the plants, the soil that actually breaks down the minerals chemically and um, creates all these compounds that are then exchanged between the plant um, and that's how they get their full amount of nutrition that the plant needs. But they've destroyed that process through tillage and chemicals. Um, and then they feed the plant nutrients through synthetic means. And they just give them a certain set of minerals or uh, nutrients, right? NPK, maybe a little bit more, uh, maybe like some 12 different minerals, something like that, right? And they're basically living on an IV drip. Like as a human being, I used to work in a hospital, hospital for three years. So I watched people in an ICU on for a month. They're just feeding them through IV or through a feeding tube, like a nutrient blend or whatever. Um, you know, you can live like that, but like, is your health, your health is not optimal, right? So that's what we're doing with plants. We're having them on an IV drip, 
Uh, they don't have biology. They just, they're just getting a few little things that they need to be able to produce green leaves and have color, but like they're totally void of nutrition and then the biology that we need to inoculate our uh, gut system. And um, I'm hoping in the future, like there's different companies that are like the, organi the Bionutrient uh, Food Association. They're working on devices that um, scan food with light and then it tells you a reading of what nutrients are in there. So I'm hoping in the future that we start pricing food based upon how much nutrients are in the food. Um, that would be revolutionary. You know, I've, I've stood next to people in a grocery store and they're looking at, let's just like, I forgot what they were looking at, but they're looking at like an organic pepper or, an, or a conventional pepper. And they were just like, well, I'm not going to get the organic one. This one's so much cheaper. I'm just going to buy the cheapest one possible. Uh, and like, that's how they're thinking. Like, that's how the average American consumer is thinking. Like, what is the cheapest thing that I can buy to put in my body? And it's just like, oh my gosh, like, how are you, how is that you're, how you're judging what you're going to put into the most important, you know, you only get one body and you're going to put stuff that has poison all over it. Like peppers are one of the most sprayed crops out there. And you know, I, I love like Joel Salatin talks about this. He's like, you know more about your mechanic who works on your car or, or like the guy who works, the person who works on your computer than you do the person who's growing food that you put inside of your body and becomes the cells of your body. Like, how does that make any sense, right? And um, so I'm hoping in the future that more people will start to realize that and um, that would shift a lot of things for sure. Yeah, the, the U.S. is importing a lot of fruits and vegetables. We import, like, a lot of things now, unfortunately. I hope the U.S. will go back to making a lot of its own stuff again. And, yeah, we got to stop stop importing for sure. It, you know, food loses its nutrition very quickly after harvest. And uh, eating food as close to harvest as possible is another very important thing that everyone should be doing. That, that's another reason to grow your own food. That's great, Mark. Keep talking to people about growing food. It's super, super important, especially young people. It's super important. A raised three plant planter. Garden girl, what type of irrigation for a raised three foot planter? That's pretty small. Um, I don't know. For that, I'd probably just go with the emitter line uh, there's, and get like every six inch emitter spacing. It's just like the skinny quarter inch, also called spaghetti line. I'd probably just use that and hook, hook up everything to a, um, I mean, if it's that small, you could also do it by hand too. But if you want to set it to automatic, then I'd go spaghetti line and you can just uh, get a real cheap orbit timer, hook it up to a hose faucet with half inch poly line, and then... Uh, the video that I just put out today on my YouTube channel is all about irrigation for raised beds, and hopefully that'll give you some good ideas. Six by two by 11. Um, yeah, I just go with a midter line for that. I, I, I think that's probably the best. Uh, lawn creeps. Well, if you listen to Elaine Ingham, she says it's possible. That, I mean, I, that's, what, that's what I did, like when I made my compost teas, I did her technique. I just put it in like a, I just took a scoop of compost in a burlap sack and then I just ran water over it and then let that brown water um, go into my tea. And she said that, it, that extracts it. So um, I'm just kind of trusting her on that. I have never verified that. Yeah, eating microgreens is a fantastic way to get vitamins and minerals. Absolutely. That's one of the best things. I think it's, uh, if you just want to get started and don't even want to build a garden, I think microgreens are a great place to start with gardening. And if you make a mistake, like, it's all good because you just plant more seeds and you got more plants in another, like, seven to ten days. So, and uh, they're very, very, very healthy. 
and I, I like my microgreens I grew. I like them better than like the salad mix that I grew. They're more tasty, I think. Oh, Stephanie, if you look in my uh, video today, you can go grab it there. That's where the affiliate link is. Thank you very much. That's really nice of you to, to go through that link for me. I, I really appreciate it. Um, that's how I pay to do all these videos. You know, no one's paying me right now to like do this live stream or to make these videos. Like, you know, I don't, you don't make much from YouTube ad, ad revenue. Um, I just do, I do it for the love of it. Can a burlap bag work as a grow bag? Uh, it's a little bit porous. It's a little bit, um, see a pork chop. Um, I, I probably wouldn't use a burlap sack, it, you know. It'll just like, it wouldn't hold water very well either. Like it just drained through. Maybe if you use like a few layers of it, I don't know. Mark, yeah, I let my, I let my garden dry in between irrigation. I like to let it go for a few days if I can and let those roots, which you want to train those roots to go out down and deep and out of there um, and, and go seek out the water and they'll create a way better, stronger root system. Um, you know, if you keep watering them every day, you're, you're babying your plant. You're keeping it, you're spoiling it, basically, is how I describe it. Yeah, don't, yeah, none, don't ever worry about sending me money or any of that stuff. I'm doing fine, guys. I just, um, I'm just explaining. <laughs> if you ever, uh, if you order through my um, affiliate link, that's like the, you know, those are the best ways. If you're going to, you're going to buy something anyways, that's just a super easy way to, to help support the channel. So, oh, well, it's 6.11. That went by fast. Well, if there's any other questions, I'll answer them. Otherwise, I think I'll take off pretty soon here. But um, if you guys haven't seen my series and you're a new gardener, I just put a five video part series out on my YouTube that you can check out. And it's all about growing your own food. And I tried to do step-by-step, -step, fairly detailed. So I try not to leave anything out that I know confuses people so that it would be easy for you guys to under stand if you're a new person to growing food and I did everything from seed starting to transplants to irrigation to what to feed your 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 beds and you know teaching all of it from a organic or you know natural perspective uh, so I really hope that it helps you guys and um, if you another way that you can just if you can help me out is just sharing my videos if you guys want to share it on a on one of your gardening groups or with any of your friends that's a great way to help me um, out and just spreading the message of growing natural food. Charcoal, um, charcoal is good, but you need to activate it and inoculate it. Otherwise, it's going to soak up all of your nutrients. So look up biochar and I would make biochar. I wouldn't just use the charcoal. I've been doing this. I started farming nine years ago. I took like three years off in between because I lived in Asia, but I farmed 24 seven for over five years and I've been studying it for nine years. I'm glad you guys have learned a lot. Really appreciate it. Thanks, you, thanks for the encouragement. Um, Daniel, I like uh, bootstrap farmer grow bags a lot. Um, I'm a fan of all their stuff. They just use the, the highest quality stuff. So. I've, I guess I'd say, yeah, bootstrap farmer. And I've got a video or two about growing in grow bags, doing irrigation for grow bags. So if you search that on my channel, you can check that out. Nice, Bradley, that's awesome. Starting your new field. Yeah, I hope all the best to you. I'm sure you're, do, you're gonna do great. Oh, cool, you're in National City, Daniel? Nice, and not too far. I lived in Lemon Grove, so that was uh, very close. And everybody, give a big thank you to Matt of Drag Strip Farm, who's uh, moderating all the live videos. He's a market gardener over in Florida. He's building his right now. So if you want to go check out somebody who's building a farm right now, he's a, a good person to go follow. So thank you guys for watching. Um, if you'd like to support my channel, that's got links down in the description. You can order products from or uh, donate through PayPal or Patreon. And never, ever feel obligated, please. Uh, 
But uh, and in, if you want to share any of my videos, that's also another great way to help me. So I really appreciate it, you guys. And uh, thanks for being interested in growing food. I hope, wish you guys all the best of luck with everything. And keep growing good stuff for your family. And I'll see you guys soon in another video. I'm, uh, I'm working on some different videos right now. And um, I'll do another live stream, I don't know, maybe in a few weeks. All right, see you, Amar, see you, Mark, see you, Zag, see you, Bradley, see you, Daniel. Have a great day. Bye.